Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is linear algebra. Today I'm not going to talk about linear algebra itself, but a related topic that sometimes is covered in the linear algebra class. In particular, I'm not going to talk about vector spaces, but I'm going to talk about vector spaces after scalars, and they are sometimes called projective spaces. And as we will see, they actually arise from ideas in, um, well, projective geometry, or rather perspectives in arts. So kind of the idea is as follows. So one of the big flaws, and of course in huge quotation marks, flaws of classical or affine geometry is that, well, reasonable lines, lines in the same plane, like here my blue line and my red line, they usually cross in a point. So this kind of a generic situation. But sometimes you have lines in the plane. So here my well, red line, uh, blue line, and my red line. And they are still completely legit lines. But as you can see, they don't cross, right? They have no crossing. And that's kind of kind of bad because in a lot of things you have some, some nice dualities like two points lie on a line. Right, so two points lie on one line. So dually, in some sense, there should be something like two lines cross in one point. Um, so now my lines are green and my point is black. But it's not quite working, right? In, in affine or classical geometry, this just doesn't work. So in vector spaces, it doesn't work. You, in affine spaces, it doesn't work. You can have parallel lines, which just don't cross. And these are a little bit annoying, right? They're related to, uh, you won't be able to solve or a, a certain a linear system of equations, system of linear equations will have no solutions and all these little bit nasty things. It, they don't matter so much, but they um, kind of annoy you from time to time. Um, I never really understood why they are so annoying, but they are just annoying. And what people tried is to kind of get rid of this flaw by introducing a notion of projective geometry of a notion where um, lines cross lines at least in the same plane right if, if, you have, if you're in three space and lines don't even lie in the same plane i mean that's fine they're not supposed to cross but in some sense these lines are supposed to cross so these are fine and these are supposed to uh, to cross and we want to get, a, get rid of that floor. So let, let's, let's have a look what we actually can do. So what people did is the following. Um, so you should think of like, here's a classical line. It's in green and the classical line is determined by one coordinate, of, of course. So in, well, in, in this case, I've just chosen the, the x-axis itself to be the classical line. And there's just one coordinate, let's say this point here is like minus one. Right, I have illustrated it in two space, but actually the second coordinate is completely useless. It's just the point minus one, right? And what people decided to do, and you will see later why this is actually a good idea and not just some random nonsense, is that the projective line, that's a red one. So um, that's a projective line, that's a classical line. Uh, the projective line has an extra point, which is the point at infinity. Um, and actually, as we will see, this is a point infinity or minus infinity at the same time, because let me explain how you build this. Okay, so if you have a projective line, you should think of it like if you have a circle and you fix one point of it, let's say the North Pole, and you can project it, that's hence the name, you can project it down onto a one dimensional line by drawing a line from the North Pole down to your line. So each point on the circle is then in one to one correspondence with one of the lines downstairs, except the North Pole itself, of course. The North Pole doesn't appear on the line downstairs, but everything else as a representative on the line. Let me show you 
and animation, which will convince you that, that this really works. So every point on the line can be matched with a point on the circle, and you have an extra point, the North Pole, which doesn't appear on the line. But the North Pole itself is both infinity and minus infinity at once. OK, here's the same situation as before. I have a projective line in red, and I have my classical line in green. And I will explain how the points match. And I already tell you that the, uh, the top black point is plus minus infinity. And you will see why. So at the moment, you can see that this line, so the, the red point is very close to the black point, And the line goes very, very far to the left. You can't even see it anymore. But it will reappear. So let's, let's have it reappear. There you go. And yeah. OK, so you vary the point, the red point, and you get any green point you want, right? The closer you get with the red point to, to the black point, the further you are away um, in this picture, either to the right or to the left. But in the end, it's a circle. So um, minus infinity and infinity are the same on this circle. Um, just keep that in mind. So everything is kind of only defined up to scalars. Projective geometry will kind of be only defined always up to scalars. But this is the matching between a projective line and a classical line up to this extra funny point. So you added something to a classical line and you get a projective line. OK, so add a point at infinity to a classical line, you get a projective line. So let's have a look a little bit. Um, so there's something called projective coordinates. They were introduced by, I think, Mobius around 150, 160 years ago. And it works like this. Just, people usually write this funny notation. So you have A, B, and you will get more coordinates if you go to higher dimensions. But for now, we only have two of them. And you should really like read it like it's A over B. Okay, so, some, something like that. So in particular, every read point here, so this is minus one, corresponds to a red point, uh, minus one over one. So the red point is minus one over one, the green point is minus one. Similarly, this green point here, which is just one, corresponds to one over one. And in this notation, you see where I want this second uh, entry, because a priori would say, mm, why do I need to, the, the, the entry anyway, right? So let's say you're here. Whatever that coordinate is, um, it's roughly here. Well, let's say that's 2.5. So this red coordinate here would be something like 0 0.25 over 1. So why do we actually need the second coordinate? You need it for the, for the funny point of infinity. Because this point of infinity here, uh, the black one, is actually 1 over 0, which makes sense, right? Because 1 over 0 is basically infinity. And at the same time, it's minus 1 over 0. So everything is only just defined up to scalars. And that's kind of the notation you would use here. It's a, a notation um, in projective coordinates. One coordinate may more than you would expect, but you kind of only need the, um, the, the last coordinate to keep track of um, uh, what is what is at infinity and what is not at infinity, what you have added extra. So it's not quite a dimension higher, right? So only only infinity in this case needs a dimension more. And now we have actually set up the whole, well, have, have the whole setup to define it uh, appropriately, to define that, that, that can tell you the precise formulation. So it works like this. You fix a vector space V, it doesn't matter so much, and you get rid of the point zero. So that you get rid of the point zero is that just basically means you don't want things that are completely zero. So this doesn't, doesn't exist. Otherwise, all, all projective coordinates will be fine, but not the one that has only zeros. Anyway, so you define exactly the relation, the equivalence relation on the set by saying things are equal up to scalars. In particular, you get something like this, right? So uh, two projective coordinates are equal. Uh, you can just scale off all of the entries by some scalar. And with projective coordinates, you just mean the corresponding 
uh, scale us in front of some chosen bases. So shows your favorite bases, like the standard bases if you want, or something like that, and read also projected. And that's a projective space. It's the vector give associated to a vector space. You start with a vector space, and you get rid of um, uh, you you mod out by the relation that things are equal up to scalar. And then everything is just equal up to scalar, and you need or you just write down the coordinates in this funny bracket notation to remind yourself that everything is just defined up to scalar. And the point is that those will be points of edibility, right? You have a zero here. And you have now quite a lot of them, of course. In higher dimensions, you have more. You have lines of infinity, you have planes of infinity that you need to add to the, the, the vector space that I mentioned lower. It's a bit confusing, so let, I will repeat this. But basically, the, the vector space that I mentioned lower is obtained by, OK, you have something that is in the last entry not zero, and then now you can divide it and get exactly the one in the back, like like we did here, right? We got the one in the back. Um, so that's fine. The only confusing thing is that you always start a dimension higher. Um, so the dimension of PV is you start one dimension higher and then you collapse something. Instead of that, that's kind of topologically um, what you really want to do in or geometrically speaking. Instead of this, what I explained that you add points, lines, or whatever. But basically, you add points, lines, or whatever at infinity. Just by the formulation, you start with one dimension higher, uh, because you, in the end, want two coordinates to determine everything, which are not really two linear independent coordinates, so you still are only of dimension one. That's a very confusing thing. So let me just say it once more. The projective space of a vector space of dimension n plus one is just of dimension n. And it's actually more appropriate to think of it like um, you obtain it from dimension vector space of dimension n by adding things. But strictly speaking, and it's much better in, in kind of abstract nonsense, um, and to, if you want to do abstract nonsense with it, it's better to define it the opposite way than, than, than I just explained. So not like adding a point at infinity, but more like starting upstairs and then collapsing everything up to scale. Anyway, so the point is, this is not a vector space. So this is a vector space up to scaling, OK? Not a vector space. It's a vector space up to scaling. But in this setup of geometry, two lines in the same plane meet at least one point. I would like to write they meet at exactly one point, but that's not quite true. The lines could be equal, for example. And basically, they made it in, in exactly one point. And that's about the formal definition. And yeah, so let me just um, wrap up by explaining where everything comes from. Um, so actually, the need for projective geometry came from arts. So if you look at paintings from the whatever 14th century, they, they don't look like people really understood uh, what perspective really is. That, that took a little bit, like in the 15th century, in the 16th century, and so on. And perspective, of course, nowadays, all of you know what perspective is. We have a, a point at a horizon, which is, of course, my point infinity. And everything kind of goes to this point at the horizon, where everything then meets. And if you follow this through, then you would kind of see the need of having kind, kind of a mathematical concept capturing this. So here I have two parallel lines. Uh, so this is just a, just a rectangle, right? And it looks like a real rectangle in three space, just as an illustration in two space, if you use this concept of having a line at infinity where everything meets. Right? So now things meet at infinity, and this point of infinity is a point of at the horizon. And that was a reason why people started to Think about projective geometry. It took it took whatever a long time to came up to come up with a, a abstract definition and so on. But this is basically the reason why they started to do it. Okay, so uh, let me wrap up. So we have projective geometry uh, coming from arts, and basically it's adding points at infinity, lines at infinity, planes at infinity, depends on your dimension. But the better formulation is to use these homogeneous coordinates. 
and um, start with one dimension higher and just mod out by the relation that everything is equal up to scale. Okay, um, that's it for today, and I hope to see you next time.